but we will have a Q&A following right towards the end with an opportunity for you to post your questions. We are really excited to welcome Dr. Lisa Weath, who will be giving you an in-depth look at pet nutrition tips for finding the right meals for your pet's needs. We will begin the, uh, with the presentation from Dr. Weath, and again, we'll have the Q&A session afterwards, so please hold your questions until the end. Before we begin, I'd love to remind you to mark your calendars for our Pet Space Wellness Workshop number two, which will be in two weeks on May 23rd. Uh, Dr. John Tegsis, who's a veterinary toxicologist, will be discussing household toxins and keeping your home safe for your pets and keeping them from getting into things that they shouldn't. So without further ado, we are pleased to welcome our speaker today, who is a board certified veterinary nutritionist who is dedicated to improving the health and wellness of companion dogs and cats through nutrition. She is the founder of Weath Nutrition Services, which is dedicated to improving the health and wellness of cats and dogs. In addition to her clinical practice, she serves, as the, she serves on the advisory councils for a number of commercial pet food manufacturers and is involved with the WSAVA Global Nutrition Committee. She's a consultant for the Veterinary Information Network and is a regular lecturer at regional, national, and international veterinary conferences. Please welcome me in joining in, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Weath. Hi, Lisa, are you here Hi. with us? Hi, JJ, thank you so much for that introduction. It, can everyone hear me okay as well? Excellent, I see thumbs up. Um, this is my first streaming lecture, so um, I hopefully be, be, be kind and patient if I make mistakes. Technology and I don't always get along well. Um, I'm also doing this lecture from home, and I have two sleeping dogs by my feet, so hopefully they will stay there and stay that way. But if they start to bark, you may see someone kind of run in from the side and, and scoot them out. Um, uh, JJ, thank you for um, inviting me and thank you to the Annenberg Pet Space for uh, in including me in this workshop series, um, especially as the kind of inaugural lecture. It's very exciting. I'm excited to be here. Um, I know everyone's had these stay-at-home orders and hasn't been able to go out very much in the last few weeks, and today is a beautiful Saturday, so I want to thank everyone who is logged in and signed in and joined us um, for spending the next hour or so with with me and with us to look at some um, what I think are important nutrition topics for caregivers and an animal owners to know. Um, I also wanted to, let's see if I can share my screen so I can get to the lecture. Uh, let's see if I can do this right. Give me a minute. There we go. Uh, so we're going to be looking at healthy diets to try to keep healthy and happy pets. Um, a little bit about, about my background. So as JJ mentioned, I'm a board certified veterinary nutritionist. Um, and what that means is I am a veterinarian. And then after, for my path is after two years, two plus years in private practice, I went back to, back to school and went back to UC Davis and did a, a residency in clinical nutrition. So specifically focusing on uh, diet and, and manipulating nutrients in the diet to help manage health and wellness and to, to manage chronic diseases in dogs and cats. So that's been my specialty focus since 2007. Um, and it's interesting, there's a lot that's kind of changed and a lot that stayed the same in animal nutrition over that time. Um, one of the things that's changed is the, the picture here in the bottom, I think this is the bottom right for everybody, is my daughter Caitlin and our, and our cat Annabelle. Um, one thing that's definitely changed is Caitlin is now going to be 18, so this is an old picture. Um, but I put it in there just to highlight that we're doing this for the human-animal bond. We have dogs and cats in our lives because we, we love them, we cherish them. We, we hope that they love and cherish us too, but with cats, especially with Annabelle, that's probably questionable in this picture. She doesn't look super happy. Um, but we're doing this to keep them help, happy and keep them healthy for as long as we possibly can. And so this is, uh, can everyone see my lectures okay? Sharing screen, perfect. Um, so this is just a general kind of overview of what we're gonna talk about today. I have this talk broken up into four general sections. The first of which is looking at a, a brief history of pet food, just to kind of orient ourselves on where we were and where we are now uh, when it comes to feeding dogs and cats. 
We're gonna look at some general nutritional requirements. So not too in depth, but a good overview of kind of what we need to think about when we're feeding our animals and kind of when we're figuring out diets and um, ingredient balances. And then looking at some commercial diets in terms of what the rules and regulations are from a labeling perspective um, and how you can kind of try to interpret those labels when you're at the store or when you're looking at them on the shelf. And then just some, what I consider some general tips and guidelines for making sure that we're, we're not only selecting the right diet, but making sure that that diet's a good match for our dogs and cats so we can keep them um, happy and healthy for years to come. Um, the backdrop in here, these are actually two of our old Labradors, Maggie and Raider, who were definitely a pair. Um, so you'll see them pop up a few times in these lectures too. I sprinkle in my lectures with a lot of pictures of my own pets um, and I consider my, my kids' pets as well at this point since they're still at home. Um, but so we go on. So looking at the history of nutrition, there's really these kind of three big pools or three big changes that happened over the course of nutrition science. And this could be human nutrition, you could input um, horse, horse nutrition or dog and cat nutrition. The very beginning, so you know, two plus hundred years ago, nutrition was just focused on, can we get enough calories to survive? And this was true for people too. Before we had kind of modern agriculture, and, and being able to go to, the go to the store to buy food, we needed to make sure we got enough calories to live day to day. So we're kind of adult maintenance, can we just go one day to the next? Nutrition then, as we figured out what the basic requirements were, we needed to figure out how do we get adequate intake for normal life stages? So can we grow normally? Can we reproduce normally? And when we look at veterinary nutrition and animal nutrition, a lot of this focus was on food animals. So it was the animals that we raised either for milk or for, for hide or for, for meat. Um, and dog and cat nutrition really was kind of later to the game. Uh, and then, you know, now we're in this area of optimal health. So now the field of nutrition has identified what we need to survive, what we need to grow and reproduce, even though most of our, our dogs and cats are not in the reproductive stage unless, we're, uh, unless you're a breeder. Um, but now we're looking at optimizing health. And so we don't have just, again, day to day. We're not necessarily focused on keeping puppies healthy, though we are, that's still a focus. But most of our animals, I would argue, are in this optimal health stage where we want them to have good health, um, not just survive day to day. I, I consider survival a pretty low bar to pass. So we want them to thrive. And we want them to, to really thrive in and have this long lifespan. So this is one of our dogs, Raider, with his gray muzzle. Um, he ended up living to be about 15, just shy of 15. So pretty good for a Labrador. Um, and really focusing on, on optimizing health. I want that for all of my patients. And I want that for all of your dogs and cats and your homes too. So when we look at the history of pet food, it really is, has been written over the last, just over a hundred years. So in the early 1900s, kind of late 1800s, we had hard biscuits. And so Spratt's biscuits in the UK was the very first commercial dog product. Um, and it was sold as a complete and balanced diet at that point. Um, milk bones took off after that here in the United States in the early 1900s. And milk bones initially were sold as a complete diet because at the time there were no other options. So you had dogs that were living off, off scraps, they were living off whatever was left over from the people or they were kind of city neighborhood dogs and so whatever they could scrounge. Um, cats weren't even really a thought until we get kind of here into the 1950s. So most of the early nutrition focus was on, on dogs and dog wellness because they were work animals for most people. They were hunting, they were, they were herding animals, they were home protection. Milk bones, again, they were focused on calories. Can we get calories? Can we meet some basic nutrient needs? Um, and then as the field was growing, the field of nutrition was growing for human products and human nutrient needs, so was the animal nutrition focus. So now we have the 1920s, we had the first canned dog foods. Um, so these are all just examples that I pulled. Um, they're not the only ones. They're the most recognizable ones though, I think for most people. Um, so we had canned dog foods. Canned dog foods at the time were literally canned whatever meat they could get. It was a lot of horse. So we had a lot of horses that were being used for, 
for work animals, for transportation, and all of those horses ended up somewhere when they didn't have their useful lifespan, um, which is not something that we necessarily want to think about nowadays, but that was the reality for 100 years ago. And so canned meat, it didn't, it wasn't necessarily balanced, but again, most people, this was a supplement to whatever they fed kind of leftover at home. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind uh, during this time, there wasn't a lot of veterinary health care involved. So vaccines hadn't hit the market. So protecting dogs from things like parvo, um, parasites, most dogs had fleas, they had ticks, they had the hookworms and whipworms, and a lot of things that shortened their lifespan. So we weren't really focused, we as nutrition or as veterinarians weren't necessarily focused on optimizing diet at this point. It was really still that survival growth and reproduction. Um, but as nutrition was growing and developing, so was the field and the manufacturing uh, ability for these commercial foods. And as we get into the post-war, post-World War II era, we have advances in society, we have the growth of the middle class, we have more people who are keeping animals and keeping dogs and cats as pets. And so nutrition for them and these commercial pet foods start growing as well. The, the very first dry kibble, actually Purina dog chow was the very first kibble to hit the market. Um, and it followed the cereal grain craze for people. So the technology for making a dry cereal that we would eat is very similar to the technology that went into making the first dry dog foods. So they were using the equipment for multiple, you know, the same equipment for multiple avenues to try to maximize profit. So a lot of the early commercial dog foods were actually human foods that were using their leftover pieces from the human food supply into pet foods. Um, the field of nutrition is still growing though, so we're still getting um, advances in, in identifying what certain nutrients are, um, what the optimal levels are. And in the kind of 50s and 60s is where cat foods start to come on the market. And so we have things like Puss in Boots, um, Friskies, and certain, certain commercial foods that start showing up on the marketplace. And then if we kind of skip the next 70 years or so, um, we have this advance in animal food options. So you walk into any pet store and you've got racks and racks of dry foods, lots of different brands, lots of different ways and types of feeding animals. So we've, we've gone from, again, from identifying just the, the basic survival to can we identify all the essential nutrients and can we then make diets that optimize health and wellness for individuals? Uh, the diets, even though these all three of these diets were sold as complete diets, if we were to compare them with any of the diets available on the market now, they would be incomplete. Because there are certain nutrients that weren't identified and weren't considered essential until even, even as soon as, or as recent as 10 years ago. So the field of nutrition is always growing and constantly adding more knowledge to help with that kind of long-term health and wellness. The one, kind of one of the important aspects of pet food to always keep in mind though is even though our focus is health and wellness, the, the companies that are selling these products may have other objectives in mind too. Um, and so if we look at, this is an, an older graph now, so 2000 to 2015, but if we, if we were to go past this and go earlier than 2000, this sales um, sales figure is pretty stable. So pet foods in general through the 1980s and 1990s sold between 10 and 12, this is billion, billion dollars a year. And it was pretty flat. And that kind of followed with the way that people approached animal health and animal wellness. And then in the 2000s, kind of 2000 to 2010, we see this big jump up. The marketing of pet foods changed. So now we have where pet parents instead of pet owners are, there are fur kids instead of just the dog or cat at home. And so this, this emotional bond is starting to really take off. I mean, be appreciated from a marketing standpoint, I should say. People have always had that emotional bond, but now the pet food manufacturers are recognizing it. And so we see this jump up from 12 billion to almost 19 billion by 2010. And then it's been steadily growing since then. And if we look at last year's figures, in the United States for pet foods and treats alone, 
it was just shy of $37 billion in sales. So we've had a huge jump up. So pet foods will you know, continue to rise and it continues to grow. And a lot of this growth is what's considered the premium pet food channel. Um, and what everyone should, should understand about that, that term premium is premium doesn't actually relate to the ingredients or the quality of the food. From a marketing standpoint, premium just means that you as the consumer are willing to pay more for it. You're willing to pay more than the market average. And so a lot of this growth is in sales, but not always nutrition quality. And so we're gonna look at some, some pet food kind of nutrient requirements. So we're gonna kind of go through the basics and then we're gonna come back around to the, the labeling and the marketing of pet foods just so that we are all um, kind of have the tools to make those decisions uh, and make those evaluations. Uh, I don't know if we have time. Everyone's still following, still okay? Excellent, excellent. So kind of one of the important concepts to keep in mind is that when we're feeding our dogs and cats, um, a lot of the marketing and a lot of people wanna think of them as wild animals. Um, Porter here is one of my patients at uh, Metropolitan Animal Specialty Hospital. He may be as large as this wolf, but he is not actually this a wolf. Um, dogs, domestic dogs and wild canids like the wolf are very, may have similar body features and similar appearances. Um, they have similar nutrient requirements, but their digestive physiology, so how their, their intestinal tracts work, how their stomach works, the enzymes they produce are very different than a domestic dog. And the same when we look at cats. So dogs have been domesticated for like over 20,000 years, I believe. Cats within the last 10,000, um, they're still a little bit closer to their wild cat counterparts, but they're not exactly the same. Um, so this is Mowgli, he is a wild cat up in, um, in Ventura County at an animal, animal rescue that was a, a patient that I didn't physically see, I did a remote consult for him, um, but he had a lot of the same problems that are domestic cats. So this is my cat Gamora who had kidney disease and intestinal food allergies and inflammatory bowel disease. And that's the same thing Mowgli had. So wild cats and wild dogs can still get the same diseases, but their digestive tracts and how we get that, those nutrients in are, are different. And so we're feeding, we're feeding the dog and cats, not necessarily their wild counterparts. When I look at diets, and so this is kind of a nutritionist perspective of food. So again, I mentioned we wanna meet energy needs, we need to meet nutrient needs, and the requirements for dogs and cats and even for people are based on nutrients. So calcium, phosphorus requirements, copper requirements, when you look at a, a, your own food labels, you'll have this recommended daily allowance or RDAs that are listed on those, and those are for nutrients themselves. Um, ingredients are just a way to get them in. So we need to make sure that we're meeting our nutrient needs, it's complete and balanced, and we're looking at can we optimize health. Um, the two graphics here on the right are just to illustrate that nutritional approaches and nutritional education, even from a human perspective, changes over time. So I, I should have pulled the older uh, nutritional pyramid that had the individual layers of fat and protein and sweet and salt and, and sugars at the very top. Uh, that changed in the 1990s to this more colorful pyramid, which only lasted about five years before the uh, FDA, USDA scrapped it and went with this plate approach. Um, dog foods, there's now a my bowl approach for dog food, so looking at the nutrients. But again, it's, it's remembering that we have categories of foods, categories of of ingredients that help us get those nutrients in. Uh, and I said we we're gonna talk about nutrient requirements in a very basic way. Um, and this is basically our list here. So we're not gonna get much more complicated than that. Uh, the diets are ways for getting protein and proteins required for nitrogen as an ingredient, as well as essential amino acids, the building blocks of protein. We need fat in the diet, both for essential fatty acids so these essential fatty acids cannot be made in the body. They have to come in through the diet. 
and they're important for things like skin and coat and immune function. We also need fat for absorption of our fat soluble vitamins. So we can't, even dogs that have fat restrictions because they have high blood fat levels or a history of pancreatitis, we still need to get some basic amounts in. Carbohydrates, so CHO is a shorthand for carbohydrates. They're kind of a plus minus. So there is no carbohydrate requirement in a diet for dogs or cats. Um, definitely not for cats uh, at, at any life stage, but for dogs, carbohydrates are a cheap energy source during certain life stages. So if you have a very young puppy, their liver may not be efficient at, at converting other nutrients to blood sugar. And so getting those carbohydrates are an easy way to get that converted easily to sugar into the bloodstream. Um, also during, for female dogs during reproduction, so during the last trimester of pregnancy and then through whelping and lactation, they absolutely require a high, um, kind of a high source of, of easy sugar. And so having carbohydrates in the diet is considered conditionally essential for certain life stages in dogs. Carbohydrates, especially the more complex carbohydrates are a great source of fiber. And fiber is not considered an essential nutrient at any life stage, but I would argue that it's important for optimal health at every life stage. So fiber is what helps keep the intestinal tract happy and healthy and keeps the cells there healthy. And so if you don't have enough fiber in the diet or you have too much fiber in the diet, it, it doesn't allow the intestinal tract to work normally. And so even though it's not essential, um, even though carbohydrates themselves aren't essential, we still need to think about them as a component of the diet that could be very beneficial or, or almost essential for certain times of life and in certain individuals. So these are our macronutrient profiles. So when we're looking at, at foods and we're looking at the calories in the food, these are the only three places that calories are coming from. So anytime we adjust one of them. So say you have a dog who's been diagnosed with kidney disease and your veterinarian says you need to go on a lower protein diet. Well, what that means is now our pool of calories from protein has gone down and one of these two or both need to go up. So we always need to keep kind of keep that in mind is this is where our, our calories are coming from. It's also where our nutrients are coming from. And then our other three big categories are vitamins, whether they're fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A or vitamin D or E, um, or they're water soluble vitamins. So these are the B vitamins and things like choline that are important for the running the cells in the body. Minerals are divided into macro versus trace. Macro minerals are minerals that are needed in gram amounts in the diet. So things like calcium, has a gram amount per dog. Um, ingredients like iodine are actually in micrograms, so one hundredth of a gram amounts. And so every, every mineral, all of the essential minerals, will have certain levels that need to get in into the diet. Uh, water is one of the nutrient categories that a lot of people forget about. It's still an essential nutrient. It's probably the most essential nutrient. You can survive not eating for a week, uh, you cannot survive not drinking for a week, um, especially under certain situations. You become very dehydrated and your organs just don't work well. Um, so water is an essential nutrient. And where you're going to see this come into play is in, in your animals. Is If you think about if you have a dog eating a dry dog food, that dry dog food is about 10% water. They, if your dog is a, say, 20-pound mixed breed dog, their water requirement is somewhere around one liter or just over four cups per day. If they're eating two cups of food and that two cups only has 10% water, they need to get that water someplace else. So when they're on that dry food, they're going to drink more. If they're getting a canned food, canned food is about 75% water, so if you have a, a dog who's eating a canned food diet or a fresh food diet that's about 60% water, you may not see them drink as much. And so I, some of the questions I've had from, from owners are, you know, I'm feeding this diet and I just, I'm, I'm really worried. I'm, I'm adding water to my dog's canned food because I just don't see them drinking as much as they did before. 
And it's really because they're getting most of their water from their diet. They don't need to drink. They're just not as thirsty. Yeah, and then this little picture here on the right, I, I borrowed from a National Geographic's website. Um, and these are mountain goats that is scaling. This is about like 500 feet up in the air. So not 500 feet, 50 feet up in the air. Um, these mountain goats will scale the cliff sides to drink Siren passing by. <laughs> I think we're good now. Um, these mountain goats will actually scale cliff sides, mountain sides. They'll climb up onto um, concrete dam sides to lick the salt that's accumulated off of these, off of these rocks. Uh, and that's because most of these nutrients are limiting in nature. So wild animals, their focus is survival and reproduction. They don't have to, if you're a calcium deficient wolf, um, your focus is not living to be 15, your focus is just living till the next day. For our dogs and cats in our home environment, we want them to be 15. And so if we leave certain nutrients out that may be limiting in nature, we could create problems year, months to years down the road. Uh, and I look at food as a delivery service for these nutrients. So this is a, a human pictures. Do not give your dogs wine. Please don't do that or your cat's wine. Um, but we want to look at, think about foods as ways of getting nutrients in to run the cell. So this is a very kind of busy image of a cell, of, an, of a stylized cell. But just to highlight that all of this machinery, all of this work is happening without our even being aware of it. And that's where these nutrients play in. So we need to make sure we're getting all of the building blocks so that everything can run as efficiently as possible. I don't think there's one perfect way to feed all dogs. So dry food's not better than canned food's not better than fresh food or vice versa. Um, we look, I look at it as what combination of foods and ingredients do we need to make sure that that animal and their cells are working as efficiently and effectively as possible. So now we look at how does that apply to pet foods themselves? And kind of the basic start of a pet food is there's a couple of resources that a pet food manufacturer may use. So one of them is the nutrient requirements for dogs and cats. This is from the National Research Council or the NRC. The NRC is the, the Non, non-profit organization that compiles all of the detailed literature for nutrient requirements. This is the one for dogs and cats. There's an NRC for people. So that's where those RDAs on our labels come from, is from the NRC for people. There's an NRC for horses. There's one for pigs. There's one for poultry. There's one for lab animals. There's, a, there's about 10 of these, depending on what species you're looking at. Uh, or for various species. The next layer is AFCO. So the Association of American Feed Control Officials is a group of state and federal feed regulators. Um, some in, they have some industry influence, but they're not part of the council itself. They're more of like an advisory role to make sure that everyone can be compliant with their recommendations. Uh, but what AFCO has done is they've taken the recommendations from the NRC, which are very kind of basic laboratory developed levels and said, okay, in a purified diet, in a laboratory setting, your calcium requirement may be 0.7 grams per thousand calories of food. But when you put that into a complex diet that has whole food ingredients that goes through a process to be made, the, that nutrient is going to bind to other aspects of the diet and it's going to decrease its bioavailability, so how readily it can actually get into the animal. So AFCO has built in a safety factor for pet food manufacturing. Depending on the nutrient, that safety factor may be twice what's in the NRC or may only be about 10 or 15 percent higher. But AFCO is what pet food manufacturers use when they're formulating their food. So they use this as, as a guideline. So this is where we figure out our nutrients. So if, I'm, if I want to make Dr. Wheat's dog chow, dog food, um, I would grab the AFCO and then I would look at, well, what ingredients do I want to use with that diet together? Um, and this is where some of the pet food marketing comes in. 
because a lot of pet foods will have nice pictures on the labels, they'll have fresh chicken breasts, they'll have all these beautiful whole grains, this beautiful cut of steak. Um, and, and a pet owner will look at that and go, that's what I want to feed. You know, I would eat that. That's what I want to give my dog or cat. Uh, but the reality is pet food manufacturers, especially if we're looking at a dry food or a canned food, this is not what's going into pet food. This is what's going into our food supply. And once this breast is removed from the chicken, that chicken um, body is getting mechanically deboned, which means it goes through a giant processor to pull out, to pull the meat off of the bone. And that's gonna include skin, it's gonna include cartilage and fat and everything else that's basically not bone. Um, the beef, it's not gonna be the beautiful steak, it's gonna be whatever little bits and scraps are left over. Still nutritious, still a good source of protein and fats and amino acids, but it's not gonna be this, this pretty look. Um, and it's probably not gonna be wet either. So this is ground wheat, dried egg powder, um, and chicken meal. And this is what will go into a commercial dry food. So when you see the words of the term meal on a pet food label, that means it has been dehydrated and defatted. So it's a chicken protein powder. Um, dried egg powder is exactly what it is, egg powder. Ground wheat is going to be the fine ground wheat that's not going into flour, it's not going into whole grains. Um, so this is what's typically used in, or these types of ingredients are what's used in commercial, especially dry food manufacturing. And then we make that into a diet. Um, this is a dry kibble, obviously, but if we were using a canned food, maybe we wouldn't use chicken meal, we'd use that mechanically deboned chicken so it would look like this kind of um, chicken sludge that gets mixed into it instead. Sludge sounds like a very bad word, but it's, it's still nutritious and healthy. Um, so that's where we are from a nutrition and getting the kind of going from basic nutrients into a whole food. Um, if we're using uh, a whole food style diet and there are some commercial whole food style diets, those ingredients probably would look closer to what goes into our food supply. So now we look at labels. And when we're looking at pet food labels, there are some requirements that are required by law to be there. And so I use these as some of the kind of the basic criteria when evaluating a pet food. If any of these things are missing or you can't find them or you have to really like contact the owner to, or the manufacturer to find it, that to me is a red flag that you, if they don't know what the basic label requirements are, how do they know what the basic nutrient requirements are? are for a food. So when you're looking at pet food, it should have the name of the food, seems pretty straightforward, and it should have what species it is. So if it's a dog food, it should say dog. Um, it can't just have a, a picture of a dog on it, it has to physically say the words. Uh, if it's a cat food, it needs to say cat foods, and those pictures have to match. Um, one of my colleagues in the nutrition college works with um, commercial manufacturers. He spent time with um, working for the FDA and, and is part of AFCO. And so he actually guides small and kind of startup pet food companies on how to put their labels together. And he would tell me stories about some of the fun labels that he saw, like the cat food that had a dog on the front. Like you can't do that. The pictures and the names have to match. The, one of the other important aspects on the label is the nutritional adequacy statement. So it should be somewhere, this is just a, an example label that I include just as a reference, it should say somewhere on there that it's complete and balanced pet food that is either for growth or for maintenance, um, or it should say that it's intended to be a treat or for short term or supplemental feeding. Um, diets that don't have a nutrition adequacy statement that they are complete diets mean that you should not feed those foods for long term um, because it's missing key nutrients that can cause problems either immediately or later on. Uh, we have to have an ingredient label. This is the one that pet food manufacturers are always really fond of having on there. So there's always an ingredient list on there. Um, ingredients are listed by order of weight. Um, so if we look at this label here, let me see if I can change my, my grid. Is There we go. Um, so if we look at this, Lamb, lamb meal, ocean fish meal, 
Um, these are dehydrated, defatted. The lamb is going to be a wet lamb meat. The amount of protein coming from the lamb meal may actually be higher than the lamb itself, but because ingredients are ordered by weight, um, they can list lamb first. And then we look at brown rice, millet, cracked pulled barley. So we've got three different carbohydrates on there, and again, ordered by weight. So potentially there could be more, um, let me see if I can get, sorry, I'm having Zoom issues here. Um, so potentially we could have a diet that has more carbohydrate-based ingredients if they're using lots of dry versions and lots of different types of carbohydrates. Um, and they may only have one protein. And if they're using a wet meat protein, it'll push it higher on the list. And it may not actually have that much chicken or that much lamb in it. So ingredients are helpful, but they're also a marketing tool from a company standpoint. Uh, they need to have a guaranteed analysis. So this is the crude protein, fat, fiber, and moisture. They're the only four things that are required on the label. And it's probably the least helpful aspect of the label. Um, these are minimums or maximums. So if I have a patient that, if I have a dog with a history of pancreatitis and I'm worried about how much fat is coming in their diet, I don't want to know the minimum fat. I want to know the actual fat level. And some of these diets can have, especially with canned foods, can have twice the fat as what's on the guaranteed analysis. It can be very high. Um, so it's not, it's required by law, but it's not very helpful, unfortunately. It also doesn't tell you of this crude protein, how much of it's coming from the lamb versus the ocean fish versus the barley or any of these other ingredients. So it doesn't tell you the, the quality or the type of protein. Um, pet food labels need to have contact information on there. So if, you're, if you have a question or a concern, you should be able to contact a manufacturer. Currently name and address, and it can either be a physical address, a mailing address or an email address. Um, most companies now have email addresses and have websites where you can submit questions, but it's not required by law, so some, not all of them have it. They have to have feeding guidelines on there. Uh, and one of the, the complaints that I'll hear from pet owners is the feeding guidelines are completely wrong. It, if I fed my dog the amount on the feeding guidelines, he would either get too fat or too thin. Um, and so they're, they're completely wrong and most people discount them. The reason why they're on the label is because they're required by law. So the company has to tell you how much of their diet to feed to maintain certain weights. These values are calculated based on averages for the average 10 pound dog, it needs X amount. For the average five pound cat, it needs Y amount. Um, the problem with those averages, and we'll look at that in a few slides, is those averages can vary dramatically based on the individual. So most companies now will list a range of calories. And as long as your dog is eating within that range, the diet's gonna be balanced. Um, where we can run into problems is dogs that have very low energy requirements. So completely normal for them, but lower than the expected. If they're eating too little of the food, they may not be getting enough of the essential nutrients. And we'll look at that in a little bit too. Uh, the last, important part of the label is the calories. Calories have only been required on pet food labels for the last six years. Uh, I joined the nutrition college and I, I took my board exam and joined the college in 2007. And my very first board meeting as a newly minted diplomat in 2008, we had, there was a, I got to listen to a, an argument slash discussion at the board meeting about whether we, we as a nutrition college should be pushing for calories because do pet owners really even care? And a lot of the older practitioners, like most people don't even pay attention to their own calories, they're not gonna pay attention to pets, so why do we as a group need to push for it? Um, but luckily the majority of the college had the opposite view and said it's very important to make sure that we're feeding animals appropriately, we're not overfeeding or underfeeding, and being aware of how many calories is is very important. Uh, I mentioned that was 2008. That discussion had been happening for two years prior to that meeting. So from 2006 until 2014 was how long it took for it to actually happen. So label requirements and label changes take a long time. These were all set up in like the 1940s, mid 40s, 
when AFCO was formed and it was based on, again, people not having the same relationship with their animals' food and with their pets as they do now. So a lot of this information seems antiquated in a weird format and doesn't mesh with what we're used to seeing on our own food labels, um, but things just take a little bit of time um, to get updated, unfortunately. Things that are on the label in terms of names. So if it says natural or holistic, these were trendy in the 80s and 90s on pet food labels and even early 2000s. Um, there's no legal definition for either of these. Um, natural from an AFCO standpoint just means it lacks artificial colors and preservatives. It doesn't necessarily mean much of anything. Um, organic does have a legal definition. Um, so it, it has to do with the handling and the processing of the ingredients or potentially the raising of the animals. It does not mean that that food is necessarily healthier than a conventionally raised one. So it just has to do with the, the production side of things. Um, in 2016, AFCO did issue statements on human grade because that was becoming a more kind of trendy topic. And you'll see that even now, you'll see that on pet foods and treats, that these are human grade products. The legal requirement is that if it says human grade, the entire product and all steps along production, so the ingredients themselves, the manufacturing, and the final product have to meet the same standards as people foods, which means you should be able to eat these. Um, and if that doesn't apply, then they can't, a company can't use the human grade label. So again, not a guarantee of quality. These are all from a manufacturing or marketing standpoint. Uh, when we look at the ingredients themselves, I mentioned meal as being the, the dehydrated, defatted ingredient. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what some of these ingredients mean but they have very specific AFCO and legal definitions. Um, so meal itself, chicken meal, can't have feathers, it can't have you know, bird poop in it, it can't have anything that's not an edible, nutritious product. Byproducts themselves is another one that, that makes people nervous. They think byproducts are you know, whatever has been swept off the floor or whatever is kind of de decomposing on the sidelines. That is not really what it is at all. Um, there can be companies that cheat. There was actually a, a fairly expensive premium price diet that was truly using ingredients that were not fit for any consumption. And they had um, inadvertently included some euthanized animal, um, euthanized horse into some of their canned foods. That is considered an adulterant that is illegal um, and not allowed according to state laws or the federal government. So byproduct itself, just means organ meats. So it's the intestines, it's the kidneys, it's the liver, it's the part of the animal where a lot of the more kind of dense nutrients, densely packed nutrients are found. It's much easier to balance a diet using things like liver or kidney than using only muscle meat. So they're actually a very nutritious part of the food. Uh, companies, and if you look at pet food labels and if you just spend time in a, in a store, uh, oh, sorry. It's like my, give me a moment, my battery is lower than I thought. Um, but if you look at ingredient, ingredient labels, um, sometimes you'll see foods that say no byproduct, big and bold on the front side of the package. And if you flip it around, um, they physically don't use the words byproduct, but they'll have beef liver and beef tripe and beef intestine and beef kidney, um, which are all byproducts. So this is a byproduct of the human food supply not necessarily a bad food to have or a bad ingredient to have. Um, when you're looking at meat, so if a food has um, a, an ingredient that says meat on it, and, and th these are, again, meat and poultry are gonna be more common with what are called flexible formula foods. So these may be ones that you find at the grocery store. Meat specifically means it's gonna be some combination of beef, pork, goat, or lamb. It can't be anything else. It can't be horse, it can't be dog and cat, it can't be um, you know, wild, wildlife that's been picked up by animal control. It's only those four food animals that have been raised specifically for food in people as well. And then what isn't used by people goes into the pet food supply. Poultry is specific to chicken, duck, and turkey. Again, it can't be anything else. It can't be pheasant 
or quail or ostrich or any of that. It has to be one of those three. Uh, the reason why companies will use these kind of catch-all terms like meat or poultry or byproduct is it allows them to be more flexible with their labels. So because of the label requirement, they have to list exactly what's in the food. And if they use the term byproduct, that means that they can use beef liver one, one batch, they can use beef tripe and intestine in the next, and they're still within their legal label requirements. So it allows them to just uh, adjust based on what's available to them at the time. And it allows them to provide a lower cost food for pet owners. Again, not a quality issue, just a flexibility and ingredient variation. The only time I worry about these ingredients from a, a clinical nutrition standpoint is if I have a patient with, a, a, say, a dog with, a, with liver disease or liver shunt, I want to avoid feeding them liver in their diet because it can make their disease much worse. So I'm going to avoid diets that use the term byproduct or diets that have liver specifically listed. If I have a dog that comes to me that's been having intestinal issues and is really itchy and recurrent ear infections, and I'm worried about a skin allergy or, a, or an intestinal food allergy, if they have, they've been eating diets that have meat and poultry in them, well, now I have to add seven possible culprits to what's causing that. And so from a, you know, a clinical perspective, it just means that there's more questions in the diet if I'm trying to treat specific conditions. Um, the last one, and then we'll go on to the next slide, is just this term gluten before I forget. So gluten is just the protein portion of a grain. So rice gluten is rice protein. Wheat gluten is wheat protein. Um, gluten from a human standpoint often refers to two specific gluten proteins found in wheat, rye, and barley. Uh, so people who have gluten enteropathies or celiac disease are specifically sensitive to the type of protein in wheat, rye, and barley. Um, but from a pet food standpoint, if you have a gluten sensitivity for your own health and the diet has rice gluten in it, it's a different, different species, different ingredient altogether, so that's still safe. Um, and preservatives, they can use natural or synthetic preservatives depending on what they're using. Um, these, the synthetic preservatives that were used historically have kind of fallen out of favor, um, but they were very effective and safe to be used in people and pet foods. So let's look at a label. Um, this is a, a, a local um, pet food produced here in LA, unfortunately. Um, some of the things that you notice on there um, what I noticed from a veterinary standpoint is it's for skin and dermis. Uh, dermis is just a fancy way of saying skin. So this is for skin and skin. Um, so when we're looking at the label. So I see things like that that kind of raise a little bit of a flag for me. Um, so then we look at, is there a species designation? And I'll tell you that this is the only label on the product. The bottom part is a clear, um, clear plastic tub that this fresh food diet was in. Um, we have a picture of a, looks like a dog in a chef's hat shaped like a bone. Um, I'll tell you that this diet was sold to a, a, a pet owner to feed to her two cats. Um, nowhere on the label does it say whether it's a dog or a cat food. Uh, and then we look at calories. So calories are required by law. This is a food label from two years ago. Um, I don't believe the current values, the current labels have calorie statements on them either. So we've got um, handling instructions, we have our recommended feeding instructions, our guaranteed analysis, and our ingredient list, but no calories. Um, we also don't have a nutrition adequacy statement. So it, nowhere on this label does it say that it's complete and balanced. It says contains over 90 minerals and antioxidant compounds. I'll tell you, there are only 11 essential minerals in the diet. So I'm not sure where the rest of these are coming from. Um, but it doesn't say anywhere on there that it's complete and balanced and it has to specifically have those words on it. So food for healthy bones, happy hearts and furry paws doesn't cut it from a legal standpoint. Um, unit amount, this is actually my favorite part of the label. It just says net weight because that's required by law to have a net weight on the label. So no number. So I don't know how much is actually in this tub. Um, the current, current labels do have a, a ounce on it now. It also doesn't have a use by date. So nowhere on the tub did it say when it was made or how, good, how long it's good for or when you should use it by. 
Um, it also doesn't say where and who made it. Um, so food labels need to say, is it manufactured for or manufactured by a certain company? It has contact information, it has a website on it, but it doesn't have um, where it came from, essentially. Some other, this is one of my other kind of favorite diet examples or label examples to use. This was shared um, by a colleague of mine. Um, so this is a, a food that's for puppies. So it says puppies in two different languages. Um, we've got omega-3s and omega-6s in that. We've got chia and quinoa seeds. So it's a very kind of hip trendy diet. It says it's complete balanced food for puppies. So it does have an adequacy um, statement on there. Um, when we look at that adequacy statement though, so we say the food here is formulated to meet the nutritional levels established by AFFCO. Um, this F here should be an A. So I look at this and that's one of the first things I said, I'm like, well, we don't even know what the, you know, how do we know what the nutrient levels are if we're not going to the right company? Um, so I'm sure this is a typo on their labels and a misprint on their labels, but the fact that it wasn't caught is a little bit concerning. Um, my other favorite part of this label is it's distrib distributed in the United States by Discount Perfumes, Inc. I would strongly discourage anyone feed their dog diets that are distributed by a perfume manufacturer or perfume distributor. We're going to stick with the people who understand pet foods. Um, but this is just another example. So when you're looking at foods, even though it seems kind of basic, some companies don't even get the basics right. So that's where we want to make sure we're, we're going with a reputable company that knows, understands animal nutrition, understands the requirements, how to put a food together and then make sure it's safe on the other end. Yeah, so is our, um, and things that aren't on the label. So if you're looking at a food and you have a dog or a cat with food allergies, you need to be aware that these foods are not made in isolation unless it's a, a therapeutic diet that's sold through veterinarians. Um, those diets, so diets that you get through your veterinarian that are either hydrolyzed or limited ingredient are made in isolation. Those manufacturing companies ensure that no other proteins, no other ingredients are in their food. Um, from a, a just over the counter standpoint though, it, they're all made on shared equipment, which means if you buy a lamb and rice diet from a company that does not have chicken and does not have corn or wheat on the label, but they make another diet or another diet in that factory is made that includes chicken, corn, or wheat, there could be bits of that protein in there. Um, and there have been a number of, of published research studies where veterinarians at different universities have pulled diets off the shelf and done DNA testing on them and shown that even though there was no chicken on the label, there's chicken in the food or, or pork in the food. There's other ingredients that you don't necessarily think that are there. And it's not that these companies are intentionally adding in lower cost ingredients, it's just that they're on shared equipment. So I equate it to if you have peanut allergies or someone in your family has peanut allergies, you're looking for that label that says what else was processed in that plant. Um, that requirement, that food allergy statement um, from a legal standpoint is not required on dog and cat food. So you have to be an advocate for your pet. Uh, also, sometimes companies do cheat. Um, so in 2015, there was a, a, a one company that sold premium priced pet foods settled a lawsuit for false advertising because they claimed that they didn't use byproduct in their foods when in reality they did. Um, byproduct is a lower cost ingredient. So if you use byproduct, you can make a better profit margin on your food. Um, there was also, I mentioned the premium food in 2007 that had pentobarbital, which is euthanasia solution. So that was a premium priced food, very expensive food that was using very poor quality and actually illegal sources of protein in their food because it was cheaper from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, there was also, a, a, there have been a number of recalls over the last few years from premium foods, especially premium raw beef diets that are, ca that are causing hyperthyroidism in dogs. Hyperthyroidism is typically considered a cat problem not a dog problem. Dogs usually become hypo and have too low of a thyroid problem. Um, but there was a premium, there's been a number of premium companies that were using lower cost beef 
that included the thyroid tissue. So they were using the gullet meat and it was causing, because it wasn't heat processed and heat cooked, it was causing disease in dogs. Um, one of the current kind of still ongoing issues that we see in certain premium foods, especially ones that are marketed as grain free or that are these kind of boutique foods is diet induced cardiomyopathy. And that's a diet induced heart disease that's being caused by the diets. And we know it's being caused by the diets because when these dogs, if it's caught early, they're changed onto different foods, different manufacturers, different kind of traditional standard pet foods um, and supported with medications if needed, but their heart disease reverses. And with typically with acquired like age related heart disease or breed related heart diseases, it does not get better with treatment. You manage it, um, until you can't manage it anymore. And these are dogs that have reversible heart disease, sometimes reversible heart failure. So premium is a marketing term. It, it relates to the cost, but not necessarily the quality of the food. And so we want to make sure that we're using a, a pet food company or a, a, you're feeding a diet that has um, some knowledge in how to make pet foods and how to keep dogs and cats healthy um, going forward. So that's the next, the last part of this, um, is keeping dogs and cats ha happy and healthy for longer term. Um, so some of the general rules I think about, so once we have you know, decided on what food we're gonna feed, we've, we've got our favorite brand, we've got, you know, everyone's doing well on it, um, we need to make sure we have calories right. I mentioned that pet food labels have a calorie content on them now, um, and they have a feeding guideline on them. Well. That's, these are the equations. So the company, the pet food companies have said for the average dog, the maintenance energy requirement. So this is, they're eating, drinking, peeing, pooping, going for walks, playing with balls, sleeping half a day. Um, is some, this is the calculation they use. For cats, we have a different calculation because cats um, have less variation in their body sizes and they have less activity. So they don't need as many calories on a body weight basis. The graph down here, this is an old graph. Um, so this was actually research that was done in the 1950s looking at energy requirements in dogs. And this is just average healthy dogs and it's calculated amount. So this is number of dogs here on the left. And this is the percentage of expected daily requirement. So most of the dogs hit right about 100% of their expected daily requirement a little bit of fluctuation, kind of 10% plus minus. But if you look at the spread, what this means is that there were some dogs that were completely happy, healthy, normal dogs that only required 45% of their calculated requirement to maintain their body weight. And there were other dogs on the other end of the spectrum that needed 100, that needed 55% above their calculated requirement. So if you have a dog that fits right into this bell curve, the center of the bell curve, where most of the other dogs live, you know, kind of plus minus 10%, if you follow the package recommendation on your pet food, you're going to be feeding your dog an appropriate amount of calories and they're going to maintain their weight. But if your individual dog is here or even down here, still completely normal within the normal range, and they're not hypothyroid, they don't have an underactive thyroid gland, they don't have any kind of intestinal issues to push them up here. This is just normal variation. You're gonna underfeed or overfeed them. So there is a range. Um, cats, the spread is a little bit, they, we still, this is the number, this is cats, and this is the comparison from expected to average. So most cats kind of fall within 100%, but it's a much, you know, kind of lower peak and it's more spread out too. So we've got more kind of noise on either side. A lot of cats kind of peak right here at about 80% of the requirement, of their expected requirement. And these are cats from, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And I would argue that the pets we have of today are probably even more efficient with their calories, meaning they don't need as much. Most of our house cats, sorry. Hold on. Somebody, Hold just, on just somebody disagrees with you. Somebody says, no, we need more calories. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going <laughs> to, sorry about that. My daughter just came home and the dogs are very happy to see her. Um, so, so when we look at the calorie requirements, there's a huge range. 
most of our cats are, are now indoor only. Um, they don't have, they're not, you know, scoping the neighborhood, looking to pick fights, looking for, for love in all the wrong corners. They are down here probably. And so if we fed our cats kind of the average on the package, we were, pro were probably overfeeding them. And so I put this picture here. Um, this is Daisy and Yukon. These are two of my patients when I was practicing in New Jersey. And these owners came to me because they had Daisy and Yukon and they had had golden retrievers for decades. This is like the fifth and the sixth golden retriever they had. And every golden retriever was like this in the past. And then they got Yukon and they're feeding Yukon half of what Daisy's eating and he's still overweight. And so completely normal, his thyroid gland was completely normal. But even if you've had dogs for your entire life and they've all been pretty, you know, right there on the, the expected range, every so often you'll get one that's a little bit outside of it. So we wanna feed the individual, not the average. And then when it comes to feeding, you know, how are you measuring it out? So this is, these are pictures from a study that was done at the University of Liverpool in the, the UK uh, at an obesity clinic that's there in the University of Liverpool. And they just asked, they had pet owners, they asked, they had vet students and staff, and they just had them measure out what do you, when you feed your animal, what's a scoop? And this is what they found. There was a huge range. This is a one cut measure. They found even within individual subjects, there was, a, there was a little bit of range. So the same person measuring the same diet the same way, maybe under a cup versus right at a cup, depending on the day. Um, accuracy between the, the measurers was completely all over the place. So there are some people whose cups are always a heaped cup, some of them that's always level, and it, there was no rhyme or reason. So what I look at this is if I'm, from a, a veterinarian standpoint, if I tell my, my client to feed one cup of, a day, I wanna make sure that we're clear what that cup is because we can, in an unintended, um, over, over or under feed those dogs and cats. Uh, and again, I, I would say this is, you know, not to harp on, on calories and obesity too much, um, but these are two patients that I saw in New Jersey. So these are real, real life examples that I had. Um, so Bella here, she was a nice round, you know, plump kitty. I'd say a lot of our house cats kind of look like Bella here. Um, I like this, this, I can't, um, and I apologize, I don't remember this one's name, um, but the grids on the floor and the, the kind of the cutting in of the harness you can see. Um, and one of the challenges from a, a, a caregiver's perspective is that, you know, we have hunger drives and we have appetite. So we need to eat for calories, but food is actually tasty. And so sometimes our animals are looking for food because not because they're hungry, but because they maybe want attention or maybe they really like that particular treat and so they want to eat it again. Um, so we need to kind of identify when are they really hungry versus when do they just want to eat something. Um, I would argue, I argue with my kids every time I make chocolate chip cookies for them, I don't necessarily need them. It's not providing any essential role in my house, but I like to eat them. <laughs> so I tell them to eat, they have to eat them first. Um, and then the natural selection. So what this means is, again, we've, we have, right now we have plentiful food. Well, in normal times when stores aren't on kind of massive back orders for things, we normally have ready access to food. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, a thousand years ago, that was not the case. And so if you think about dogs have been with us kind of 20 plus thousand years, cats 10-ish thousand, thousands of years. And the early ancestors of these two species had some selective pressure from people, meaning the ones that could survive with fewer calories are the ones that survived. And so now we have a situation where we have this big range in requirements, probably because of people. So our influence in there. Um, and, and normally, under normal times, you know, food is not love, um, whether you're talking about people or pets. Um, sometimes the emotional attachment and the relationship in, reinforces those bonds. And for, from a dog and a cat perspective, you know, now we're spending more time with them. So we have to be careful that we're spending time with them and giving them positive reinforcement in a way that's, 
going to enrich that bond without necessarily enriching their waistlines. So we want to try to keep them thin. And, and obesity and being overweight isn't uh, a cosmetic issue. It's really a health issue. And so it increases the risk and the stress around the heart. So heart disease um, can be a factor for dogs and cats just as it can for people. Um, joint disease, more stress on the joints. From a, especially from a cat perspective, it increases the risk of diabetes and it decreases their lifespan. So we want to make sure we're looking at you know, the body condition of the animal um, from both the side and the top. So here is this ridge back here. It doesn't look too bad. He's got a nice kind of a tuck up similar to our breed standard. But when you look at him from the top, he's kind of a, kind of a tube. So he's He's the same around his chest as he is around his waist. He's a little bit thicker than he should be. Um, and when we're looking at body condition, this is what your veterinarian would use to evaluate that. And this is something that you can use at home too. So when you feel over their ribs, and this is a, this is a dog chart, but there's a cat chart and the principles are the same for the cat chart. We wanna feel over their ribs. How well can you feel ribs without having to push down? Do we see this kind of narrowing at the waist? So do you see the edge of the rib going into their waist or do we start to lose that definition? Um, do we start to get little kind of rolls around the shoulder blades and around the base of the tail um, or are we nice and trim? And this was actually research done through one of the, the pet food companies where they did a longevity study. So that decreased lifespan with obesity comes from research that was done looking at the effects of obesity on Labradors. And they had, these are paired litter mates. So they're, they're two sisters that came from the same parents, same age. And the only difference between the two is the amount of food they got. So the one that was on, that's here on the right, was allowed to eat pretty much as much as she wanted. And there were multiple pairs like this. As much as she wanted, they actually had to stop it so that she didn't get to be too heavy because they just wanted her a, kind of a little bit overweight or what a typical lab would look like. Um, and so we have this dog who's about 15 to 20% over her ideal body weight. And then what they did is they, they measured out how much that dog ate to maintain that, that higher weight. And they took 25% off and they fed that to the sister. So the sister only got 75% of what the other one did. So we had a dog that maintained about a four and a half. So kind of right in this ideal range compared to a dog that was a six to a seven. And what they found was that the dog who was lean lived two years longer than its heavier sister, heavier litter mate, um, and had a delay in needing treatment for joint disease by a year and a half. So they moved around better, they lived longer when they were lean. So kind of the number one thing that you as a, as a pet parent, as a caregiver can do for your dogs and cats is making sure that we're keeping them trim um, so we're not creating problems that, that we could otherwise avoid. Um, so that's calories. So the next one that when you look at kind of my nutrition rule number two, we need nutrients, not ingredients. So for me, it doesn't matter how that food comes in. If your dog, your cat is eating it, doing well, so everything's going in and out normally. So good food intake, good water intake, um, poops are normal forms, urine is normal and appropriate, um, and they're a good body weight, as long as the diet's complete and balanced, it doesn't matter what form it is, with one exception that we'll talk about. Um, but this graph is just to show you, this could be any nutrient. It could be calories, it could be calcium, it could be um, protein, certain amino acids, it doesn't really matter, it could be anything. And this is function and performance. For every nutrient, there's an optimal range. And, so, and depending on the nutrient, it could be a wide range or a narrow range. There's gonna be areas where if you get a little bit less than that or a little bit more than that, you're still okay. But we definitely have toxic, toxic and deficient. So we wanna make sure that we're always staying within this optimal range, no matter what our food is. Because we, again, we wanna keep them ha happy and healthy and prevent disease whenever possible. Uh, this is an example of a dog with rickets. Um, this is what rickets looks like in a puppy. This is a puppy that was seen by a general practitioner in New Jersey uh, that I worked with. And this puppy was purchased from a breeder. Um, the owners felt that fresh food was the best way. So this dog was fed ground beef and vegetables. 
out of puppies. So this is calcium deficiency and vitamin D deficiency, not allowing those bones to form normally. Um, I feel like my lectures probably, I talk too much, but well, if everyone's still okay, feel free to drop off if you need to leave for time, but I probably have like 10 more minutes maybe. Um, so this is just another example of, of making sure they're always focusing on balanced diet to meet our needs. So this was, I you know, call this, you know, when, when a good diet, when we think we're doing a good thing, but it goes the wrong way. Um, so this is one of a litter of three kittens that came into UC Davis when I was a kind of an early resident there. Nine week old, this is a nine week old male kitten, was rescued from a local shelter three weeks prior. So at six weeks of age, someone found them at the, or came to the shelter and decided they were gonna foster them um, to adopt them. Uh, was seen by uh, its GP because after three weeks, the kittens weren't walking normally. They weren't wanting to play. They were still bright and alert and they still looked like they wanted to play, but this one was, was kind of dragging its leg and not wanting to jump up. Their initial thought was infectious disease because these were kittens coming from a shelter situation. Um, but when they finally did x-rays, this is what they found. So then the, the cats were referred to the nutrition department at Davis um, to figure out why is this calcium, why is this cat's bones bending? So for those of you who aren't used to looking at x-rays, on x-rays, air is black bone is white and everything that is soft tissue or shades of gray. So this is where the cat's pelvis is. You can't see it very well. Um, this is one of the long bones, so that one of the, the femurs and it's actually bent right here. So it's not completely like fractured like you would see from a, an abrupt break, but it's folded because the bones are too soft. You can see little bits of white in here um, so the owner recognized um, about a week before that she wasn't adding any supplements and so started adding ground bone to it. But you can see the ground bone in the cat's intestinal tract is actually brighter white than the bones of its body. Um, so when they questioned her on what she was feeding, she wanted to feed what she thought was the best thing for cats in this kind of wild type diet. And it was raw meat and fresh seasonal produce. So it was, she was going to the farmer's market and buying produce. She was buying um, kind of organic, free range, what she thought was really good meat. The problem was it wasn't balanced for cats and it wasn't balanced for growing cats. So the recommendation from the, the nutritionist who ran the service at the time said, go to the store, buy any kitten food you want. Doesn't matter if it's dry, if it's canned, just buy one that's labeled as kitten food. So she went to the store and bought a dry kitten formula and then came back six weeks later, and this is what the cat's bones look like. So here's that folding fracture that's now actually nice and white. So now we can see we still have air is black. Bone, the cat's bones, even after six weeks on the balanced diet, are looking pretty white again. They're not perfect, but a lot better. So we can actually make out the bones on this x-ray compared to intestines and, and skin and fat and muscle. Um, in kittens, um, this is so nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism or calcium or vitamin D deficiency. If it's caught early, the kittens can, can still grow and heal and recover. If this was an adult dog who was fed an unbalanced diet for a few years, it's a little bit harder to fix. Um, the animal may look completely fine and normal from the outside. This kitten actually on the previous six weeks before had blood work done that was 100% normal for a kitten. Calcium was normal, everything looked good. So if you just do blood work, it's not gonna show you some of these problems that are happening underneath the surface. Um, and then I kind of wanted to show you, so looking at the home-cooked diet, um, I get a lot of questions on home-cooked diets being better or you know, healthier, more natural, more nutritious. So I just went online and pulled uh, one a recipe that was labeled Doggy Hamburger Helper to look at. Um, so again, you know, I'm always thinking about calories and I'm thinking about nutrients when we're looking at this. Um, I didn't put amounts in there because I don't want anyone to try to make this recipe at home. <laughs> so this is just as an example, but there were specific amounts in the recipe. Uh, it said hamburger meat, stir fried in canola oil, uh, boiled egg chopped, cooked plain oatmeal, 
baby food green beans, baby food carrots, and cottage cheese. And these were the actual instructions. So combine all ingredients, serve at room temperature, a good doggy multivitamin mineral supplement may be added for good measure, store in the refrigerator in a covered container and use after three days. Um, so the only parts I recommend are store in the refrigerator and use within three days. <laughs> Um, but let's look at this. So then I, I plug this into my balancing formulator. So it just said ground hamburger. It didn't say whether that's 80% lean, which would give us 708 calories per batch, or 90%, 95% lean, which would give us 521. Depending on the fat content of the meat, we get a huge protein range. So ME is metabolizable energy. So this is where our calories are coming from. So it ranges from 30 to 45% or 29 to 45% protein, 35 to 57% fat, um, pretty low carb, but depending on the, the type of ground meat you use, it'll dramatically change the calories, it'll dramatically change the protein and fat levels. And then I just pick pet tabs because that's probably one of the more common chew tabs, at least um, there's a lot more options now, but that was one of the more common ones in the past. Um, and pet tabs are really designed to be added to, or in all of these vitamin, these doggy vitamin and minerals are designed to be added to commercial diets that are already balanced. So if you then try to take that and add it to a home cooked diet, depending on what ingredients you pick, you need 12 to 28 pet tabs to meet the calorie requirement to balance out this 500 or 700 calories. And with that, iodine was still deficient. There, there's very little iodine in a pet tab and vitamin D was toxic. So the typically, so the calcium is usually what's limiting in a lot of home cooked diets. So this one had, had cottage cheese added in and cottage cheese may be a fine or a dairy may be a fine calcium supplement for our diets because our calcium requirement is 0.5 grams per thousand calories of food. So if you have a 2000 calorie diet, you need one gram of calcium. For dogs, the calcium requirement, the minimum calcium requirement is one gram per thousand calories or double. And some animals, if, they're, if they have a lot of intense activity or if they're growing and reproducing, it may be 1.5 or two grams per thousand calories. And dairy is not going to do it. We need to get calcium, either calcium carbonate or bone meal added to the food. Um, so then we get kind of look at, we put these all together. And so we have dogs that have, can have variations in their food intakes. We have different ages, different breeds, breed dispositions for diseases that all come into play. Um, you know, so we talked about the calorie levels and you're feeding for different dogs. Um, and there really isn't one perfect way and one right answer. So we have to think about what does that individual need? So we want to make sure that we're feeding for the individual and we're, we're being flexible with our options to make sure we're meeting those needs. Um, one of the questions that I get frequently is raw meats. Like what about raw meat? I've heard, I talked to my breeder, I talked to the trainer, I talked to the person at the dog park three months ago when dog parks were open. Um, and they told me that I need to feed, if I love my animal, the best thing to feed them is raw meat. Um, and I say that I'm not necessarily against feeding raw meat, I'm against disease. You know, so there's a lot of issues that come about from raw meat diets. If you're looking at bones and raw food, uh, or if you're looking at the bones and raw food and you're looking at bones in there, bones can cause damage. So if you allow your cat or dog to chew on these bones, they can break teeth. Um, they can chunk off pieces of bone that can cause intestinal damage and cause obstructions. And whole bone, if we think about back to that cat, um, that the kitten's x-rays, the bone in that cat's intestinal tract was denser than the bones of its body because whole bone is not very absorbable. It has to be a really finely ground powder for the body to be able to kind of lock into those nutrients and pull them out. Raw meat diet also carries a very real risk of bacteria and parasites. Um, I actually had a, a patient just this week who was being fed a raw commercial diet um, until they were diagnosed with salmonella, um, cryptosporidium, which is a parasite that you get from raw meat or unclean water, 
and Clostridium difficile overgrowth. So needless to say, this dog was having diarrhea um, kind of all over the place. And so no other sources of contamination. The dog wasn't going out and hiking and, and eating rotting carcasses or drinking, drinking water. It was all coming from the food. And so we have to be very careful that we're, again, always focusing on optimizing health and wellness, and we're not doing anything that could potentially create problems in dogs. Um, we also have to keep in mind that these bacteria and parasites can be transmitted to us. Even if you don't handle the food, even if someone else washes the food, you know, handles the food, feeds them in the kitchen, everything gets cleaned and bleached and sterilized after the fact, well, your dog or your cat is not sterile. They're gonna go poop in their litter box or poop outside. Um, they're gonna come inside and they're gonna lick their butts because that's what dogs do. They're gonna walk through poop and they're gonna lick their paws. And so they're gonna have a constant source of bacteria in their mouths. And if they then lick you or you touch them, I mean, now I think people are better about hand washing and, and hygiene practices in general. But if you're around your animal and they have salmonella in their saliva and you get that on you and you don't wash your hands before you touch your food or touch your mouth or prep food, um, it can give it to you. And there have been a number of, of cases in the last few years with people getting salmonella and pathogenic E. coli that makes them very sick. Uh, and a lot of the raw, the commercial raw meat recalls that have happened in the last four to five years have been because people in the households have gotten sick, not from handling the food, but just being in the households with the animals. Um, one of the other kind of fun facts with raw meat is this emerging antibiotic resistance. So what they're finding is that raw meats are, have a higher percentage of antibiotic resistant bacteria on them. Normally, it's not a problem if you're cooking your food, those bacteria get killed. But if you're feeding it raw, um, bacteria like to share their antibiotic resistance. They have little things called plasmids in them that they like to transmit to other bacteria. Um, and so they can potentially be a source of antibiotic resistance for people as well as for treating animal disease. Um, and then we talk about you know, the nutrient imbalances and some of the raw meat, if you're pre prepping it at home, some of the recipes are very vague, just like the recipe we looked at for the doggy hamburger. Um, and people feed raw um, this, for the same reasons that they feed home-cooked diets, because they want to know where the sources of their ingredients are coming from. They want to make sure that there's no, no preservatives or they want it to be completely natural. And they have, they may have had, you know, their kids that have grown up and left, or they, they don't have other family members and they want to have that emotional connection. And dogs love it. 